Today I got to interview someone who I've been looking forward to interviewing for a long time. Stephen Elliott is the creator of the Coherent Breathing Method. He's also the president of Coherence, and I'll leave a link to their website below. And he is the life scientist and biofeedback researcher who did most of the fundamental research into the origins of Coherence. And along with his co-author, Dee Edmondson, he literally wrote the book on the Coherent Breathing Method. Um, in this interview, he shares with me some of his top tips for getting the most out of coherent breathing if it's something that you're interested in doing and getting the benefits out of. Stephen, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Um, I've interviewed some kind of giants in breathwork on this channel, um, but of, of all the people that I've interviewed, I think that uh, your work has had definitely the most profound effect on my life, and it's certainly of all of the breathing techniques that I've used, it's the one that I use uh, the most. So this is a real kind of uh, honor to get to talk to you today about coherent breathing. Um, yeah, and I'm a little bit nervous actually. <laughs> uh, so yeah, your book, um, The New Science of, of Breath, was uh, having a, a profound impact on my life before I'd even read it um, because of how it's used by Drs. Gerbarg and Brown, who, who I'm sure you know. Um, and I guess people coming to, to this video will have an idea about coherent breathing. They'll know that maybe it's to do with pacing the breath and maybe that it's to do with uh, something around five or six breaths per minute. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what, in your view, is coherent breathing? Thank you, Tom. Uh, my pleasure meeting you too. Uh, I've uh, watched a number of your videos and uh, found them very interesting and uh, very nicely done. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, uh, coherent breathing, the definition in the new science of breath is breathing at the nominal rate of five breaths per minute. Uh, technically, it's 0 0.085 hertz which is 5.1 breaths per minute. And uh, then the second part of the protocol is uh, relaxing, conscious relaxation during uh, breathing. Uh, first, we learn to breathe at the nominal rate of five breaths per minute with equal periods of inhalation and, ex and exhalation. That naturally has a relaxing effect on the body, uh, in particular, low threshold muscle motor units throughout the body uh, let go. And these are the ones that, that are, uh, support the spinal column and the joints and, and the fingers, the fine muscles that are, that are under very uh, fine nervous system control. Mm. So when the nervous system is noisy, these muscles stay tense. Breathing at the nominal rate of five breaths per minute for a period of time automatically causes them to relax. Mm. So just uh, breathing at five breaths per minute and rem remaining still which I don't speak about a lot, but uh, remaining perfectly still uh, will lead one into a deep state of relaxation and ultimately into uh, meditation where there isn't anything else to learn uh, regarding how to meditate. But the, uh, once we're eliciting this internal relaxation, then we aid that consciously by uh, scanning the, uh, what I've termed the six bridges the diaphragm being uh, the, the obvious one that got my attention, but having researched uh, all of the areas of the body over which we have explicit dual control, there are in fact six zones. And we scan those from top to bottom, uh, the, the head and face, tongue and throat, hands, diaphragm, pelvic floor, and feet. And uh, the, the goal was to learn to keep these zones relaxed all the time, circumstances permitting. Now, you can, uh, you can get into this deep state of internal calm and quiet simply by breathing and being still. The relaxation of the six bridges, uh, I found, was necessary to elicit the awakened mind brainwave pattern, which is how they came to be. Mm -hmm. So. In the beginning, I, I wasn't really searching for a breathing method per se. And I had no intention of creating coherent breathing in the beginning. Uh, I was searching for a protocol for, for reliably eliciting the awakened mind brainwave pattern. But I found uh, that that protocol was very akin to resonant breathing. And uh, ultimately I landed on the five breaths per minute 
uh, frequency with equal periods of inhalation and exhalation. Mm. And then uh, the six bridges uh, on top of that uh, elicited the awakened mind reliably for me. So these six bridges, um, if you could remind me what they are, because there's an order to the importance, isn't there? Uh, yes, there are, there are actually 12, uh, 12 muscle groups throughout the body that make up the six bridges. They can be grouped into six, but generally they are the head and the face. Uh, note that we, uh, the eyes have explicit dual control also, like the diaphragm. And when you say uh, dual control, so that means that they're con they, we are able to consciously control them, even though they're normally controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Is that that's right? exactly right. And uh, the, the mouth is the same way. We can open and close it. Um, the throat is the same way. The glottis has this function, uh, as does, does the tongue. So the tongue and throat are the second uh, set of muscle groups uh, as we move down. The, uh, the hands are the third, and that's the, the third branch of nerves coming off of the spinal column. Uh, the diaphragm is fourth, uh, controlled by the phrenic nerve and the pelvic floor, and the group of muscles in that vicinity are bridge number five, and the feet are number six. Mm. Now, yes, um, that's exactly right. These are, these are the uh, areas of the body that possess an open and closed state, if you will. Mm. Hands, mouth, eyes, uh, they all have this dual uh, autonomic and somatic nervous system control. So the diaphragm was the key uh, one, and upon researching, uh, you know, the other ones became the logic of it. I, I now refer to them as the input-output uh, uh, zones of the body and the primary zones via which we interact with the external world. So it makes sense that, uh, you know, sort of like any other organism, uh, these are the areas of the body that, that we can open fully to uh, the world around us or close uh, mm -hmm. to the world around us. And so, so um, I know you, you have this famous track, Two Bells, that yes. we can breathe in time with, and that's at that um, 0.85 hertz you mentioned. Yeah. Point, um, uh, 0 0.85, yeah. So, sorry, 0 0.85, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So when... If, uh, and I'll leave, a, I'll leave that in the description to this video as well for people watching this if they want to go and try the music. Um, so how does the six bridges relate to that? If I'm breathing in time with the bells, do I deliberately relax on the out, out, out breath? Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, the, way, um, the way the body works, Tom, is um, like a pendulum. And this is, this is nature. Uh, so this is in keeping with nature in general. Um, it moves in a sinusoidal fashion. And um, if we had a pendulum uh, on a clock, which I do here, uh, that pendulum is moving in a sinusoidal fashion. Mm. And uh, when we breathe, uh, one, of, one of the uh, finer points to coherent breathing is that we want to learn to, to move the diaphragm in a sinusoidal fashion as well. Now, this is sort of step number one in the coherent breathing protocol. And uh, the reason for that is that one can't consciously relax without breathing slowly, deeply, and rhythmically. In other words, we have to facilitate this low threshold muscle motor unit relaxation before we can then aid that relaxation consciously. And so you mean that there's, there's like a, almost an inertia, so breathing in, but then it slows gradually. Yes. Mm. Yes, mm -hmm. I've heard you put that really beautifully before um, in one of your videos where you said the sine wave is the signature of, of nature. Yes. And, and so how, how, what, did you, what do you mean by that? Uh, it's, it's vibratory. Uh, the, sign, the sign function is, is a vibratory signal. And um, uh, throughout nature, if you, if you watch vibration, um, it, it has a sinusoidal rhythm to it. Now that rhythm can, can vary in frequency, but the, the time domain signal of it is essentially sinusoidal. A swing set on a playground is another really great example. Uh, when, we're on a, when we're on a swing, it's very important that we sort of provide equal 
effort uh, going up and down, right? We have to synchronize our body uh, with the up and down action of, of the swing. Otherwise it becomes herky jerky or it comes to a stop. Mm. So when we get on a swing, this, uh, this is one, really one of the early things that my sister and I used to play with and that is getting on a swing with long chains, you know, so you can go really high and then <laughs> exhale, exhaling as we go one direction and inhaling as we go another. Okay. And uh, it is it is a, essentially that model, yeah, that uh, coherent breathing emulates. So we're breathing in time with, for example, the, the two bells track that, that is quite famous in, in the world of coherent breathing. Mm -hmm. And we're deliberately, consciously relaxing the six bridges, these places where... During body... exhalation in particular. And, uh, during, okay, that, yeah. Yeah, and... because, because during inhalation, the body, uh, the nervous system naturally swings towards sympathetic emphasis and tightening of low threshold muscle motor units. Mm. Um, the in-breath during activation. exhalation, yeah, during exhalation is the opposite. I see, yeah. And so- And that's unavoidable. Uh, this is a matter of uh, the middle way. Uh, it's, it's a matter of balance. I'm a big believer in uh, uh, tra traditional Chinese medicine and uh, philosophy and the middle way I find in general is, uh, is correct. Mm. It, it's, a, it's the way of the world, it's the way of the sine wave. We've got the breathing the rhythmically, deliberately relaxing on the um, exhalation, particularly yes. in the six bridges, and then that deliberate sinusoidal element to the breath. Yes. It, so that's the core practice of coherent breathing. Yes, and, um, and I would remain, I would uh, add to that uh, stillness. If, uh, if we want to experience coherent breathing, which is uh, when, I, when I see a client, uh, my objective during our first meeting is that they experience what uh, coherent breathing can do uh, for them. And they do this by, by typically breathing along with the uh, Respire One vocal instructive sequence, which is a, a track you may be familiar with where I say, inhale two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four. And um, that fades over time into uh, a babbling uh, mountain brook. And it's, it's, uh, the reason that track is, is uh, the one to learn with is, is that if you haven't studied very much, you haven't read the book, mm. if you listen to that track, it's very difficult to go wrong. I mean, point is, it's very easy to understand what to do. Inevitably, uh, people that try it get it. And my goal is that my clientele get it within three meetings with me, if not one, in which case they can carry coherent breathing away from a session and begin practicing it on their own and, and uh, eliciting the same experience that they get uh, in session in an office, which sort of by definition is uh, either they fall asleep or they have a meditative experience and come out of that with, uh, with a profound sense of, of inner calm and quiet mm. and relaxation. Is, is there anything good? <laughs> feels good. Is, is there anything um, we should be doing to prepare our bodies at all or can we go straight into the breathing? You know, I've always, I've always practiced yoga uh, as well, and I uh, practice qigong as well, and tai chi as well, uh, martial arts as well, and uh, so I've I've always in integrated coherent breathing into the, all of those activities. So, what I like to say, Tom, is that uh, we want to engram coherent breathing to the extent that we can breathe this way all the time, circumstances permitting. So it becomes an integral part of how you know, our state, our body-mind state. And um, there are times, you know, when, uh, when life calls for not breathing that way. Uh, exercising is a good example. Shouldn't right. be exercising. Well, the, uh, the magic here is that uh, synchronous breathing remains completely viable when we exercise. Uh, the runner's high is elicited by synchronizing the breathing with the body movement. And um, this is true for swimming and cycling and almost every other rhythmic activity or sport. So yes, one can get 
a great benefit by breathing with synchrony and rhythmicity, but not at the rate of five breaths per minute, of course, because the, uh, the body's demanding more, more uh, diaphragm activity than that. Mm-hmm. And that's primarily because it's demanding more blood flow uh, and in that blood uh, gas exchange. Mm-hmm. So this is why exercise places demand on breathing. Uh, talking, talking of the, the diaphragm, you, you mentioned um, in, a, in another video how the diaphragm can move. It's got about 10 centimeters range of motion. Yes. Mm-hmm. Should we be aiming to move the diaphragm uh, that much in coherent breathing, or should we? Is it is it less about the m- amount of movement and more about the rate? The um, practical maximum is uh, seven point five c- uh, centimeters tall. Uh, Ten is the uh, sort of theoretical maximum, but seven point five is the practical maximum. And really, I promote uh, using half of our diaphragm range. So instead of, uh, instead of a half a centimeter, which many people uh, live on that much diaphragm movement, uh, we try to move it two and a half centimeters down when we inhale and two and a half up when we exhale. And uh, we, can, we can move it more than that, in which case the, the, blood, uh, the blood wave exiting the lungs, entering and exiting the lungs when we inhale and exhale uh, becomes larger. Mm-hmm. So uh, one can experiment with this. It is true that in the beginning, m- many people don't understand that they have a diaphragm, nor do they understand that they have conscious control over it uh, to the d- degree that we know we do now. So it, it takes a bit of practice to get them to even begin to breathe consciously. Yes, yes. Uh, I, one, of the, one of the things that I use in session with clientele is a balloon. And uh, I hand them a balloon and I take a balloon and we inhale as deeply as possible and then blow into that balloon as far as we can, as much as we can, and do that until the balloon is full. And um, inevitably, uh, just one practice of that method will increase a client's heart rate variability by, by five or 10 beats, just because that action of requiring the diaphragm to move down as we inhale deeply Mm -hmm. so we can blow into the balloon, which we all know how to do, and then exhaling fully to blow as much air as possible into the balloon, uh, wakes up the diaphragm range momentarily to the extent that immediately you can see an increase in heart rate variability and valsalva wave uh, amplitude. Wow. So it it is that easy to wake it up, but it is not that easy to train it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a subscriber to Maxwell Maltz's uh, theory, uh, which says that to develop a engram um, that we can then keep requires t- uh, practicing for uh, 20, 20 minutes per day for 21 days straight. Well, that was one thing I was going to ask you, actually. How, how long, well, I suppose, what, what are the benefits if people are coming to this? with not much experience, what are the benefits of coherent breathing? And I'm guessing you're gonna say 21 days, but how long till we see some of those benefits? If, uh, if one practices uh, according to the instructions, uh, which are in the new science of breath, then one can experience the benefits uh, the first time they sit down to breathe. To engram this such that uh, we realize when we're not breathing this way, which does happen, requires about three weeks. Of, of regular practice. Mm-hmm. And then we, then we catch ourselves at a stoplight or whatever, holding our breath or, you know, uh, being tense, uh, noticing that the jaw is tense or, uh, or, you know, hands gripping the steering wheel. Mm-hmm. These, these are indications that we're not breathing uh, slowly, deep in, deeply and rhythmically because that will go away. That, that response will go away when, uh, when we are yeah, so, so it's almost in, it's in training that awareness anyway, that body, embodied awareness. Yes. Yeah. In particular, we can sense uh, this tension in the bridges mm. because we have, we have this ex- explicit dual control. We have a lot more afferent and efferent nervous function uh, of the bridges. So more, more interoception. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who, who do you think stands to gain the most from, 
learning to care and breathe? Or do you think it's just something that everyone should do? Well, I believe it's something that everyone should do. Uh, my mission currently, Tom, is, um, is to uh, eradicate uh, essential hypertension. And uh, the reason for that is that I believe essential hypertension is a, a symptom of suboptimal breathing. And um, it relates to uh, suboptimal uh, brain function and consequently suboptimal uh, mental function. So um, I, I, hope to, uh, I hope to change the world, uh, how the world thinks by ultimately um, attacking the symptom of essential hypertension, which affects about 60% of the world's population. Yeah, so I, I consider the symptom of suboptimal breathing. And then if I equate that directly, we can say that uh, well over 60% of the world's population breathes suboptimally. Mm. And, and what kind of results have you seen with hypertension using coherent breathing as an intervention? Well, uh, you, can lower, uh, you can lower blood pressure in uh, three minutes. If you put a, put a blood pressure cuff on, assess your blood pressure, breathe with a vocal instructive sequence or two bells when you're acclimated to that for three minutes, five minutes, check your blood pressure again and it will be lower. Um, wow. If you have instrumentation, you can watch it drop almost instantaneously as we're going about breathing. And the, the reason why that happens is uh, when we begin to inhale with depth, it draws the blood out of the venous tree into the lungs, which can store a large volume of blood, say 750 milliliters max. That's a wine bottle full of blood. And uh, then when we exhale, that blood is ejected from the lungs uh, via uh, elasticity uh, out into the left heart and then out into the arterial tree. Mm. The problem with the uh, human circulation is that we're vertical and uh, therefore uh, blood tends to pool in the lower half of the body below the chest, below the heart. And the head is carried above the chest and heart. And uh, if, the, uh, if the diaphragm doesn't move down with uh, significant depth, then it fails to generate an, a relatively negative pressure in the thoracic cavity to which venous blood needs to return. Mm. The mode of force for blood to return, venous blood to return to the chest is very, very small. The pressures are very, very small in the venous system. So I argue that as, as we evolved into being erect beings, adequate uh, use of the diaphragm is a requirement for our brains to function correctly, for mm -hmm. our circulation to function correctly, uh, and for our brains to function correctly, and therefore for our minds to function correctly. And is this compounded by... Um that kind of modern problem of everyone being seated all the time and not having that space for the diaphragm? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's more a, um, it's more a matter of uh, education. Mm. Uh, one, I found that one can uh, b breathe with adequate diaphragm movement when we're standing, uh, when we're seated, and uh, when we're lying, lying down, of course. Mm. Uh, that's when the diaphragm is the most free to move. Um, so I have, I have one more question about tips for doing the coherent breathing method, sure. uh, which is I know you've talked about um, using a weight uh, mm -hmm. and placing it on the torso. Um, and I just wonder, is that related to that arterial pressure that you, you were mentioning just then? And, what, and where should I put it? <laughs> yeah, you put it at the peak of the abdomen. Uh, so when you're lying down, uh, we, you want to find the peak of your abdomen. So like, like, like here, just... uh, yeah. When you when you inhale deeply, your your abdomen will, yeah, yeah. So you want to center that weight on that peak, and that way the weight won't fall off, right? Okay. If you find if you find the center, then the center of gravity of the weight will be on it. <laughs> it's uh, it's lucky I've I've been growing this belly in uh, my winter hibernation. To demonstrate that. The uh, the reason for that practice, uh, Tom, is that. Um, we paid a lot of attention to the thoracic cavity in the lungs, which store and uh, eject blood upon inhalation and exhalation. But below the diaphragm is the uh, 
the abdominal cavity, also a sealed cavity in which the uh, digestive organs reside in the mesenteric circulation, mm. which is sort of the equivalent to the uh, pulmonary circulation in terms of blood storage and ejection, but it works the opposite way. Um, interestingly enough, the um, enteric nervous system, which controls the abdominal function and the autonomic nervous system, which controls the, uh, the thoracic function, work in opposition. So when we inhale, the, the autonomic nervous system speeds up, but the enteric nervous system slows down. Oh. And when we exhale, uh, the autonomic nervous system slows down, but the enteric nervous system speeds up. And you can see why this would be true because the digestive organs and movement of uh, digestive matter through the uh, organs of digestion is aided by the diaphragm. When, it, when the diaphragm moves down and puts pressure on the di digestive organs, then the peristaltic uh, action can slow down. Mm. And then uh, when the diaphragm moves up and the pressure is released, then the peristaltic uh, action increases. Stephen, thank you so much for, for giving me so much good knowledge there about the coherent breathing method. You're welcome, Tom. Uh, my pleasure. So I really hope you enjoyed hearing what Stephen had to say. Both he and I will be speaking at the Breathing Festival in February, which I'll leave links for in the description below. If you'd like to know more about Stephen's work, then please do check out the links in the description. I've left links to the music and to his website and uh, some interesting instruments that he's developed to measure Valsalva waves in the body. If you found this video interesting or useful, I've done another video with Stephen about the science behind it. We go into a lot more detail about how he ended up discovering this. Really interesting video if you're interested in coherence, so please do check that out. I'll leave a link around here in a moment. And if you found this video helpful or interesting or any of the above, please do give it a like. It really helps the channel. And of course, if you want to watch more videos about breathing and breathing techniques and meditation and creativity, then hit that subscribe button and I'll see you again soon. Thank you.